Nine suggestions on how to get the most out of this book. First, if you wish to get the most out of this book, there is one indispensable requirement, one essential infinitely more important than any rule or technique, unless you have this one fundamental requisite. A thousand rules on how to study will avail... Avail... Little... And if you do have this cardinal endowment, then you can achieve wonders without reading any suggestions for getting the most out of the book. Endowment. 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 The action of endowing something or someone in any kind of form of funding financing. Endowment. Then you can achieve wonders without reading any suggestions for getting the worst, getting the most out of the book. What is the magic requirement? Just this, a deep driving desire to learn, a vigorous determination to increase your ability to deal with people. A deep driving desire to learn, a vigorous determination to increase your ability to deal with people. How can you develop such an urge? By constantly reminding yourself how important these principles are to you, picture yourself how t how their mastery will aid you in leading a richer, fuller, happier, and more fulfilling life. How to, by constantly reminding yourself how important these principles are, and picture yourself how their mastery will aid you to leading, in leading a richer, fuller, happier, and more fulfilling life. Say to yourself, over and over, my popularity, my happiness, and sense of worth depend to no small extent upon my skill in dealing with people. No small extent. My popularity. No small extent upon my skill. The first. Second one. Read each chapter rapidly at first to get a bird's eye view of it. You will probably be tempted then to rush on to the next one, but don't, unless you are reading merely for entertainment. But if you are reading because you want to increase your skill in human relations, then go back and reread each chapter thoroughly, and in the long run this will mean saving time and getting results. Read each chapter rapidly at first. Then, uh, reread each chapter. This is the second part. Third, stop frequently in your reading to think over what you're reading and ask yourself just how and when you can apply this, apply each suggestions. How? apply the suggestions. Fourth, read with a crayon, pencil, pen, magic marker, or highlighter in your hand. When you come across a suggestion that you feel you can use, draw a line beside it. If it is a four star suggestion, then remove the star and far easier to review rapidly. Okay, read, 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 read it with the crayon. And I knew, fifth one is I knew a woman who had been office manager for, for a large insurance concern for 15 years. And every month she read, she read all, she read all the insurance contracts her company had issued that month. Yes, she read many of the same contracts over month after month, year after year. Why? Because the experience had taught her that that was the only way she could keep her provisions clearly in mind. I once spent almost two years writing a book on public speaking and yet I found it I had to keep going back over it from time to time in order to remember what I had written in my own book. The rapidity, rapidity with each with which we forget is astonishing. So if you want to get a real lasting benefit out of this book, don't imagine that skimming through it once will suffice. After reading it thoroughly, you ought to spend a few hours reviewing it every month. Spend a few hours reviewing it every month. Keep it on your desk 
in front of you every day glance through it often keep constantly impressing yourself with the rich possibilities for improvement that still line the off offing line the offing the more distant part of the sink. Awesome. Remember that the use of these principles can, made, can be made habitual only by a constant and vigorous campaign of review and application. There is no other way. Sixth one is once Bernal, Bernard Shaw once remarked, if you teach a man anything, he will never learn. Shaw was right. Learning is an active process. We learn by doing. So, if you desire to master principles you are studying in this book, do something about them. Apply these rules at every opportunity, and if you don't, you will forget them quickly. What knowledge? Only knowledge that is used sticks in your mind. Apply these rules at every opportunity. You will probably find it difficult to apply these suggestions all the time. I know because I wrote the book and I and yet frequently have found it difficult to apply everything I advocated. For example, when you are displeased, it is much easier to criticize and condemn that condemn than it is to try to understand the other person's viewpoint, and it is frequently easier to find fault than to find praise, and it is more natural to talk about what you want than to talk about what other person wants and so on so as you read this book remember that you are not merely trying to acquire information you are attempting to form new habits and yes you are attempting a new way of life that will require time and persistence and daily application you are a new way of life and that will require time and persistence and daily application so refer to the pages often, regard this as a working handbook on human relations, and whenever you are confronted with some specific problem, such as handling a child, winning your spouse to your way of thinking, or satisfying an irritated customer, hesitate about doing a natural thing, the impulsive thing, this is usually wrong. Instead, turn to these pages and review the paragraphs you have underscored. Then, try these new ways and watch them achieve magic for you. Seventh is to offer your spouse, your child, or some business associate a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating certain principles. Make a lively game out of mastering these rules. Eighth is to the president of an important Wall Street bank once described in a talk before one of my classes, a highly efficient system he used for self-improvement. This man had little formal schooling, yet he had become one of the most important financiers in America, and he confessed that he owned most of his success to the constant application of his homemade system. This is what he does, and I'll put it in his own words as a cue as accurately as I can remember. For years, I have kept an engagement book showing all the appointments I had during the day. My family never made any plans for me on Saturday night, for the family knew that I devoted a part of each Saturday evening to the illuminating success process of self-examination and review and appraisal. And after dinner, I went off by myself, opened my engagement book, and bought over all the interviews and discussions and meetings that had taken place during the week. And I asked myself, what mistakes did I make that time? What did I do was right? And in what way could I have improved my performance? What lessons can I learn from that experience? And I often found that this weekly review made me very unhappy. And I was frequently astonished by my own blunders of course as the years passed these blunders became less frequent sometimes i was inclined to pat myself on the back a little after one of these sessions this system of self-analysis self-education continued day year after year did more that did more for me than any other one thing i have ever attempted it helped me improve my ability to make decisions and it aided me enormously in all my contracts in my in all my contact with people i cannot recommend it too highly why not use a similar system to check up on your application to the principles discussed in this book if you do two things will result first you will find yourself engaged in an educational process that is both intriguing and price priceless second you will find that your ability to meet and deal with people will grow enormously 
illuminate too close so I was still meeting but had taken place and I'm a devoted part of each Saturday evening to the illuminating process itself examination and review and appraisal. Ninth is to you will find at the end of this book several blank pages on which you should record your triumphs in the application of these principles. Be specific, give names, dates, results. Keeping such a record will inspire you to greater efforts. And how fascinating these entries will be will be when you chance upon them some evening years from now. In order to get the most out of this book, keep notes in the back of this book where you have applied these principles. Keep the record, blank pages record, record your triumphs in the application of these principles. Part 1. Fundamental Techniques in Handling People Part 1. Fundamental Techniques in Handling People First, if you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. several principles. First, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. And then, the second one is the big secret of dealing with people. Give honest and sincere appreciation. appreciation. Third, he who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Arouse in the other person an eager want. Arouse in the other person an eager want. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Give honest and sincere appreciation. Arouse in the other person an eager want. Then part two is to six ways to make people like you. Six ways to make people like you. First, do this and then you will be welcome anywhere. Become genuinely interested in other people. Second is a simple way to make a good first impression. Smile. Second. Third, if you don't do this, you are headed for trouble. Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. Fourth, an easy way to become a good conversationalist. Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Fifth is to 
how to interest people. Talk in terms of the other person's interest. Sixth is to how to make people like you instantly. Make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Six ways. Become genuinely interested in other people. Smile. Remember that person's name is too. That person's the sweetest, most, and most important sound in the language. Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Talk in terms of the other person's interest. Make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Part three is how to win people to your way of thinking. First, you can't win an argument. The only way to get the best in an argument is to avoid it. Second, a sure way of making enemies and how to avoid it. Show respect for the person's for the other person's opinions. Never say you're wrong. If you're wrong, admit it. If you're wrong, admit it quickly and em empathetically. A drop of honey. Which means begin in a friendly way. The secret of so Socrates. Socrates. Get the other person saying yes, yes, immediately. Sixth is to the safety valve in handling complaints. Valve. Valve. The safety valve in handling complaints. Let the other person do a great deal of the talking. How to get cooperation. Let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. Eighth is the formula that will work wonders for you. Formula that will work wonders for you. Try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. What everybody wants. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. An appeal that everybody likes. Appeal to the nobler motives, nobler. 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 The movies do it, TV does it, why don't you do it? Dramatize your ideas. When nothing else works, try this. Throw down a challenge. When people to your way of thinking, the only way to get the best an argument is to avoid it. Show respect to the other person's opinion. Never say you're wrong. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and empathetically. Begin in a friendly way. Get the other person saying yes, yes immediately. Let the other person do a great deal of the talking. Let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. Try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. Appeal to the nobler motives. Dramatize, dramatize your ideas. Throw down a challenge. Part 4 is be a leader, how to change people without giving offense or arousing resentment. First, if you must find fault, this is the way to begin. Begin with praise and honest appreciation. 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 Honest appreciation. How to criticize and not be hated for it. 
call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. Talk about your own mistakes first. Talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. No one likes to take orders. Ask questions instead of giving direct orders. Let the other person save face. Let the other person save face. How to spur people on to success. Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be hearty in your pro appro approbation and lavish in your praise. Give a dog a good name. Give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. Make the fault seem easy to correct. Use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. Making people glad to do what you want. Making people glad to do what you want. Make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. How to be a leader. A leader's job often includes changing your people's attitude and behavior. Some suggestions to accomplish this. Begin with praise and honest appreciation. Call attention to people's, make mis people's mistakes indirectly. Talk about your own mistakes before criticizing other person. Ask questions instead of giving direct orders. Let the other person save face. Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be heart senior approved. Appro approbation and lavish in your praise. Give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. Use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. Make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. Shortcut to distinction by Lowell. If you're interested in any of that, experiences in applying the principles taught in this so if you want handling people if you want to gather honey don't kick over the beehive Seventh, nineteen thirty-one. The most sensational manhunt New York City had ever known had come to its climax. After weeks of search, two gun Crowley, the killer, the gunman who didn't smoke or drink, was at bay, trapped in this, in his sweetheart's apartment on West End Avenue. One hundred and fifty policemen and detectives laid sage. Siege. 150 policemen and detectives laid siege. Military operations could have sensation. To his top floor hideaway. hideaway. They chopped holes in the roof. They tried to smoke out Crowley, the cop killer, with tear, tear gas. Tear gas. Then they mounted their machine guns on surrounding buildings. And for more than an hour, one of New York's fine residential areas, reverberated, reverberated. Reverberate. Reverberate. Reverberated with the crack of pistol fire in the rat tide out of machine guns. Crowley, crouching behind an overstuffed chair, fired incessantly at the police. Fired inse incessantly. Incessantly. Incessantly.
she talked about it. residential areas reverberated with the crack of pistol fire and the rub tub tide of machine guns. Crowley, crouching behind an overstuffed turret, fired incessantly at the police. 10,000 excited people watched the battle. Nothing like it had ever been seen before on the sidewalks of New York. When Crowley was captured, police commissioners, Commissioner E.P. Mulroney, declared that the two gun dis Corrado was one of the most dangerous criminals ever encountered in the history of New York. He will kill, said the commissioner, at the drop of a feather. But how did Tugon Crowley regard himself? We know, because while the police were firing into his apartment, he wrote a letter addressed to whom it may concern, and as he wrote, the blood flowing from his wounds left a crimson trail on the paper. In his letter, Crowley said, Under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one, one that would do nobody any harm. Nobody any harm. A short time before this, Crowley had been having a necking party with his girlfriend on a country road out on Long Island. Suddenly, a policeman walked up to the car and said, Let me see your license. Without saying a word, Crowley drew his gun and put the policeman down with this, with a shower of lead. As the dying offer, officer fell, Crowley leaped out of the car, grabbed the officer's revolver, and fired another bullet into the prostrate body. And that was the killer who said, Under my coat is a very hard, but a kind one, one that would do nobody any harm. Crowley was sentenced sentenced to the electric chair when he arrived in at the death house in Sing Sing. Did he say, this is what I get for killing people? No, he said, this is what I get for defending myself. The point of this story is this. Two gun, Crowley didn't blame himself. Two gun, Crowley didn't blame himself for nothing, for anything. Is that an unusual attitude among criminals? If you think so, listen to this. I have spent the best years of my life giving people the lighter pleasures, helping them have a good time, and all I get is abuse, the existence of hunted man. That's A.I. Capone. L. Speaking. Yes, America's most notorious public enemy, the most sinister gang leader who ever shot up Chicago. Capone didn't condemn himself. He actually regarded himself as a public Benef benefactor and a an unappreciated and misunderstood public benefactor and so did dutch before he crumpled up under gangster bullets in new york new york new york new york York. Dutch, one of New York's most notorious rats, said in a newspaper interview, interview that he was a public benefactor and he believed it. I had I have had I have had some interesting correspondence with Louis Lowe. 
who was warden of New York's infamous Sing Sing prison for many years on this subject, and he declared that few of criminals in Sing Sing regarded themselves as Batman. They are just as human as you and I, so they rationalize, they explain, they can tell you why they had to trap, they had to crack a safe or be quick on trigger finger. Most of them attempt by a form of reasoning fallacious or logical to justify their anti antisocial acts even to themselves, consequently stoutly maintaining that they should never have been imprisoned at all. If L, two gun Crowley, and the desperate men and women behind prison walls don't blame themselves for anything, what about the people with whom you and I come in contact? John, the John Wanamaker, founder of the stores that bear his name, once, of, once co confessed, I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have, e I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen it seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence. Wanamaker learned this lesson early. I personally had to blunder through this old world for a third of a century before it even began to dawn upon me that 99 times out of 100, people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it may be. Criticism is futile. futile, futile. 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 Criticism is futile and pointless because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes them makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. Fuel tile puts a person on defensive and usually makes him strive to justify him himself. And criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious, precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. B. F. Skinner, the world famous psychologist, proved through his experiment experiments that an animal rewarded for good behavior will learn much more rapidly and retain what it learns from far more effectively than an animal punished for bad behavior. Later studies had have shown that the same applies to humans. By criticizing, we do not make lasting changes and often incur resentment. Another great psychologist said, as much as we thir thirst for approval, we dread condemn condemnation. Condemnation. We dread condemnation. Anticipate with great We dread condemnation
and we dread condemnation, the resentment that criticism engenders can demoralize employees, family members and friends and still not correct the situation that has been condemned. George B. Johnson of Enid, Oklahoma is the safety coordinator for an engineering company. One of his responsibilities is to see that employees wear their hard hats whenever they are on the job in the field. He reported that whenever he come across workers who were not wearing hard hats, he would tell them with a lot of authority of the regulation and that they must comply. As a result, he would get sullen acceptance and often after he left, the worker will remove the hats. Remove the hats. Sullen. 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 Got sullen acceptance. He decided to try a different approach. The next time he found some of the workers not wearing their hard hat, he asked if the hats were uncomfortable or did not fit properly. Then he reminded the man in the pleasant tone of voice that he, that the hat was designed to protect them from injury and suggested that it always be worn on the job. The result was increased com com compliance increased compliance with the regulation with no resentment or emotional upset. You will find examples of fertility of criticism bristling on a thousand pages of history. Take, for example, the famous quarrel between Theodore and President Taft, a, a quarrel that split the reputation the Re Republican Party, put Woodrow Wilson in the White House and wrote bold, luminous lines across the First World War and other altered the flow of history. Let's review the facts quickly. When stepped out of the White House, he supported Taft, who was elected president. Then Theodore went off to Africa to shoot lions. When he returned, he exploded. He denounced Taft for his conservatism tried to secure the nomination for the third term himself, formed the Bull Moose Party, and all but demolished the GOP in the election of that followed. William Howard Taft and the Rep Republican Party carried only two states, Vermont and Utah, the most disastrous defeat of party had ever known. Blamed Taft. He blamed Taft, but did President Taft blame himself? Of course not. With tears in his eyes, Taft said, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Who was to blame? Roosevelt or Taft? Frankly, I don't know and I don't care. The point I'm trying to make is that all of his criticism didn't persuade persuade Taft that he was wrong. It, it merely made Taft strive to justify himself to re, reiter, reiterate with tears in his eyes. Reiterate. Reiterate. Didn't think. Taft strived to justify himself to I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have what I have. Or take teapot scandal. It kept the newspapers ring. I could have done any differently from what I have. Who was to blame? Roose Roosevelt or Taft? Frankly, I don't know and I don't care. The point I'm trying to make is that all his criticism criticism didn't persuade Taft that he was wrong. It merely made Taft strive to justify justify himself to reiterate with tears in his eyes. I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Or take the teapot dome oil scandal. Kept the newspaper ringing with indig indignation in the early 1920s. It rocked the na nation. Within the memory of living men, nothing like it had ever happened before in America American public life. Here are bare facts in the scandal. Albert B. Fall, Secretary of the Interior in Harding's cabinet, was entrusted with the leasing 
of government oil reserves at Elk Hill Teapot Dome, oil reserves that had been set aside for the future use of Navy, did Secretary Paul competitive bidding? No, sir. He handed the fat, juicy contract outright to his friend, Edward, and what did Donny do? He gave Secretary Fole what he was pleased to call a loan of $100,000. Then, in a high-handed manner, Secretary Fole ordered United States Marines into the district to drive off competitors whose adjacent wells were snapping oil out of the Elks, Elk Hill Reserves. These competitors drives driven off their ground at the end of guns and bayonets. Bayonet. 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 Ends of guns and bayonets rushed into court and blew the lid off the teapot dome scandal. A stench arose to arose to so vile that it ruined the Harding administration. No stated an entire nation threatened to wreck the Rep Republican Party and put Albert Fall behind prison bars. Fall was condemned viciously condemned as few men in public life have ever been. Did he re repent? Never. Years later, Herbert Hoover intimidated, in, in, intimated in a public speech that President Harding's death had been due to mental anxiety and worry because a friend had betrayed him. When Mrs. Fall heard this, heard that, she sprang from her chair. She swept. She wept. She shook her head her fist and at fate and screamed what harding betrayed by fall no my husband never betrayed anyone this whole house full of gold would not have would not tempt my husband to do wrong he is the one who has been betrayed and led to the laughter and crucified there you are human nature in action wrongdoers blaming everybody but themselves we are all like that so when you and I are tempted to criticize someone tomorrow. Let's remember L. Two Gun Crowley and Albert Fall. Let's realize that criticism are like homing pigeons. Homing pigeons. They always return home. Let's realize that the person we are going to correct and condemn will probably justify, justify, justice, justify, will probably justify himself or herself and condemn us in return. Or like the gentle Taft will say, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. On the morning of April 15th, of 9, uh, 1865, Abraham Lincoln lay dying in a hall bedroom of a cheap lodging house directly across the street from Ford's Theater, where John had shot him. Then Collins, Lincoln's long body, two sh long body lay stretched diagonally across a sagging bed that was too short for him of cheap reproduction of rosa famous painting the horse fair hung above the bed and a dismal gas jacked flickered yellow light as lincoln lincoln set, lay down lay dying secretary of war stanton said there lies there lies the most perfect ruler of the man, of men that the world has ever seen. What was the secret of Lincoln's, Lincoln's success in dealing with people? I studied the life of him 
for 10 years and devoted all of three years uh, to writing and rewriting a book entitled The Unknown. I believe I have made as detailed and exhaustive a study of his personality and home life as it is possible for any being to make. I made a special study of his method of dealing with people. Did he indulge in criticism? Oh yes. As a young man in Pigeon Creek Valley of Indiana, he not only criticized but wrote letters and poems ridiculing people and dropped these letters on the country roads where they were sure to find sure to believe were sure to be found. One of these letters aroused resentment that burned for a lifetime. Even after he had become a participating lawyer in Springfield, he attacked his opponents openly in letters published in the newspapers, but he did this just once too often. In the autumn, he ridiculed a vain pugnacious politician by the name of James. He lampooned him through an anonymous letter published in the Springfield Journal. The town roared with, with laughter. Shield, sensitive and proud, boiled with an in, in indignation. He found out who wrote the letter, leaped on his horse, started after him, and challenged him to fight a duel. Lincoln didn't want to fight. He was supposed to dueling but he couldn't get out of it and save his honor. He was given the choice of weapons. Since he had very long arms, he chose, he chose cavalry broad swords and took lessons in sword fighting from West Point graduate. And on the appointed day, he and Shields met on a sandbar in the Mississippi River, prepared to fight to the death, but at the last minute, their seconds interrupted and stopped the duel. That was the most lurid personal incident in his life. It taught him an invaluable lesson in the art of dealing with people. Never again did he write an insultant letter. Never again did he ridicule anyone. And from that time on, he almost never criticized anybody for anything. Time after time during the Civil War, he put a new general at the at the head of the army of the Potomac Hooker. Potomac and each one in turn. Pope Burnside Hooker blundered dramatically to drove Lincoln to pacing the floor in despair. After half the nation savagely condemned these incompet incompetent generals, but Lincoln with malice towards none, with charity for all, held his peace. One of his favorite quotations was, Judge not that not that ye be not judged. And what and when Mrs. Lincoln and others spoke harshly of the Southern people, he replied, Don't criticize them. They are just what we would be under similar circumstances. Yet, if any man ever had occasion to criticize, surely it was Lincoln. Let's take just one illustration. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought during the first third, three days of July, and during the night of the July 4th, Lee began to retreat southward while storm clouds deluged the country with rain. When Lee reached the Potomac, Potomac with his f defeated army, he found a swollen, impassable river in front of him and a vic victorious Union army behind him. Lee was in a trap. He couldn't escape. Lincoln saw that here was a golden, heaven-sent opportunity, the opportunity to capture Lee's army and end the war immediately. So with the surge of high hope, he ordered him not to call a council of war but to attack Lee immediately. He telegraphed his orders and then sent a special messenger to him demanding immediate action. And what did General Hindu 
he did the very opposite of what he was told to do. He called the council of war in direct violation of Lincoln's orders, and he as he hesitated, he procrastinated, he telegraphed all manners manner of excuses. He diffused he refused point blanks to attack Lee. Finally, the waters receded, and Lee escaped over the Potomac, Potomac with his forces. Lincoln was furious. What? What does this mean? Lincoln cried to his son Robert. Great God, what does this mean? We had them within our grasp and had only to stretch forth our hands and they were ours, yet nothing that I could say or do could make the army move. Under the circumstances, almost any general any general could have defeated Lee. If I had gone up there, I could have whipped him myself. In bitter disappointment, Lincoln sat down and wrote him this letter. And remember, at this period of his life, Lincoln was extremely conservative and restrained in his phraseology. So this letter coming from Lincoln was tantamount, tantamount to the rest book. Tantamount. Tantamount to the severest rebuke. My dear general, I do not believe in I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp, and to have closed upon with upon him would, in connection with uh, with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south do so south of the river when you can take with you very few, no more than two thirds of the force you ha you then had in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect and I do not expect that you can now effect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably because of it. What do you suppose him did when he read, read the letter? He never saw that letter. Lincoln never mailed it. It was found among his papers after his death. My guess is, and this is the only guess, that after writing that letter, Lincoln looked out of the window and said to himself, just a minute, maybe I ought not to be so hasty. Hasty? Hasty. 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 Maybe I ought not to be so hasty. It is easy enough for me to sit here in the quiet of the White House and order him to attack. But if I had been up at Gettysburg, and if I had seen as much blood as him has, as he has been has seen during the last week, and if my ears had been pierced with the screams and shrieks of the wounded and dying maybe i wouldn't be so anxious to attack either if i had his timid temp temper temper temperament perhaps i would have done just what he had done anyhow it is watered down the bridge now if i send this letter it it will relieve my feelings but it will make him try to justify justify himself and I it will make him condemn me it will arouse hard feelings impair all his further useless as a com commander and perhaps force him to resign from the army so as I have already said Lincoln put the letter aside for the for he had learned by bitter experience that sharp criticism and rebukes almost invariably end in few to in, futi, in futility. Theodore said that when he as president was confronted with the perplexing problem, he used the 
to lean back and look up at a large painting of Lincoln, which hung above his desk in the White House, and ask himself what would him do if he were in my shoes. What? How would he solve this problem? The next time we are tempted to admonish somebody, let's pull a five-dollar bill out of our pocket, look at his picture on the bill, and ask, "How would him handle this problem if I, if he had it?" Mark Twain lost his temper occasionally and wrote letters that turned the paper down, turned the paper brown. For example, he once wrote. To a man who had aroused his ire, the thing for you is burial permit. You have only to speak, and I will see that you get it. On another occasion, he wrote to an editor about the proofreader's attempts to improve my spelling and punctuation. He ordered, "Set the matter according to my copy hereafter, and see that the proofreader retains the suggestions in the much of his decayed brain." The writing of these stinging letters made Mark Twain feel better. They allowed him to blow off steam, and the letters didn't do any real harm. But because Mark's wife secretly lifted them out of the mail, they were never sent. Do you know someone who would like to change and re regulate and improve? Good, that is fine. I'm all in favor of it. But why not begin on yourself from a purely selfish standpoint? That is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others. Yes, and a lot less dangerous. Don't complain about the snow on your neighbor's roof when your own doorstep is unclean. But if, but why not begin yourself from a purely selfish standpoint? That is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others. That is a more profitable than trying to improve others, and a lot less dangerous. It is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others. When I was still young and trying hard to impress people, I wrote a foolish letter to Richard Harding Davis, an author who once loomed large in literary literary horizon horizon of America. I was preparing a magazine article about authors, and I asked Davis to tell me about his method of work. A few weeks later. Earlier, I had received a letter from someone with this notation at the bottom, dictated but not read. I was quite impressed. I felt that the writer must be very big and busy and important. I wasn't the slightest bit as busy, but I was eager to make an impression on Richard Harding Davis. So I ended my short note with the words "dictated but not read." He never troubled to answer the letter. He simply returned to me with this scribbled across the bottom. Your bad manners are exceeded only by your bad manners. True, I have blundered, and perhaps I deserve this rebuke. But being human, I resented, resented it. I resented it so sharply that when I read the death of the Richard Davis ten years later, the one thought that will still persisted in my mind, I am ashamed to admit, was the hurt he had given me. If you and I want to stir up the resentment tomorrow that may rankle across the decades and endure until death, just let us indulge in a little singing criticism, no matter how certain we are that it is justified. When dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic; we are dealing with creatures of emotion, creatures of wrestling with prejudice. Prejudices and motivated by pride and vanity. We are not dealing with creatures of logic. We are dealing with creatures of emotion, creatures bristling with prejudices and motivated by pride and vanity. Bitter criticism caused the sensitive Thomas Hardy, one of the finest novelists ever to enrich English literature, to give up forever the writing of fiction. Criticism drove Thomas, the English poet, to suicide. Benjamin Franklin, tactless in his youth, became so diplomatic, so adroit, adroit, 
at handling people that he was made American ambassador to France. The secret of his success, I will speak ill of no man, he said, and I sp and speak all the good I know of everybody, he said. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do, but it takes character and self-control to understanding and forgiving. great man shows his greatness by the way he treats little man. Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot and frequent performer at air shows, was returning to his home in Los Angeles from an air show in San Diego, as described in the magazine Flight Operations at 300 feet in the air. Both engines suddenly stopped by deft maneuvering he managed to land the plane but it was badly damaged although nobody was hurt hoover's first act after the emergency landed was to inspect the airplane's fuel just as he suspected the world war ii prop propeller plane he had been flying had been fueled with jet fuel rather than gasoline Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the me mechanic who had serviced his airplane. The young man was sick with the agony of his mistake. Tears streamed down his face as Hooper, as Hoover approached. He had just caused the loss of a very expensive plane and could have caused the loss of three lives as well. You can imagine Hoover's anger. One could anticipate and tongue lashing that this proud and pre precise pilot would unleash from the carelessness but hoover didn't scold the mechanics mechanic he didn't even criticize him instead to he put his big arm around the man's shoulder and said to show you i'm sure that i'll never do this again i went to service my f-51 tomorrow i want you to service my f-51 tomorrow Often parents are tempted to criticize their children. You would expect me to say don't, but I will not. I'm merely going to say before you criticize them, read one of the classics of American journalism, Father Forgets. It originally appeared as an editorial in People's Home Journal. We are reprinting it here in the author's permission, as condensed in the reader's digest. Father Forgets is one of those little pieces which dashed off in it in a moment of sincere feeling strikes an echoing chord in so many readers as to become a criminal perennial reprint favorite since its first appearance father forgets has been reproduced writers the author in hundreds of magazines and house organs it has been reprinted almost as extensively in many foreign languages, I have given per personal permission to thousands of who wish to read it from school, church, and lecture platforms. It has been on the air on countless occasions and programs. Oddly enough, college periodicals have used it, and high school magazines sometimes a little piece seems mysteriously to click. This is, this one certainly did. Listen, son, I am saying this as you lie asleep. One little paw crumpled under your cheek, and the blonde curls stickily wet on your damp forehead. I have stolen into your room alone just a few minutes ago, as I sat reading my paper in a li library a stiff fling wave of remorse swept over me guilty i came to your bed bedside there are the things i was thinking i was thinking son i have been cross to you i scolded you as you were dressing for school because you gave your face merely a dab with a towel i took you to task for not cleaning your shoes and i called out angrily when you threw some of your things on the floor at breakfast i found fault too you spilled things you gulped down your food you put your elbows on the table you spread butter to the steak on your bread and as you started off to play in a made for my train 
You turned and waved a hand and called goodbye, Daddy, and I frowned and said in reply, Hold your shoulders back. Then it began all over again in the in the late afternoon. As I came up the road, I spied I spied you down on your knees playing marbles. There were holes in your stockings, and I humiliated you before your boyfriend spy marching you ahead of me to the house. Stockings were expensive, and if you had to buy them, you would be more careful. Imagine that, son, from the father. Do you remember later when I was reading in the library? How you come how you came in timidly with a sort of hurt look in your eyes when I glanced up o over my paper, impatient at the inter interruption. You hesitated you, ha you hesitated at the door. What is it you want? I snapped. You said nothing but ran across in the one in one tempestuous plunge and threw your arms around my neck and kissed me. In her small arms tightened with an affection that God had set blooming in her heart, in which even neglect could not wither. And then you were gone, patterning, patterning up the stairs. Well, son, it was shortly after that my paper slipped from my hands, and terribly, terrible, sickening fear came over me. What has habit been doing to me? The habit of finding fault and repaying reprimanding this way my reward to you for being a boy it was not that i did not love you it was that i expected too much of youth and i was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years and that was and there was too much that was good and fine and true in your character the little heart of you was as big as the dawn itself over the wide hills this was shown by your spontaneous impulse to rush in and kiss me good night. Nothing else matters tonight, son. I have come to your bedside in the darkness, and I have knelt there ashamed. It is feeble atonement, and I know you would not understand these things if I told them to during your waking hours, but tomorrow I will be real daddy. I will charm you, charm with you, and suffer when you suffer, and laugh when you laugh. I will bite my tongue when impatient words come. I will keep saying as if it were a ritual. He is nothing but a boy, a little boy. I am afraid I have visualized you as a man, yet, I, yet as I see you now, son, crumpled and weary in your cot, I see that you are still a baby. Yesterday you were in your mother's arms, your head on her shoulder i have asked too much too much instead of condemning people let's try to understand them let's try to figure out why they do what they do that's a lot more profitable and interviewing than criticism and it breeds sympathy tolerance and kindness to to know all is to give to know all is to forgive all god himself sir does not propose to judge man until the end of his days why should you and i don't criticize condemn or complain instead of condemning people let's try to understand them try to figure out why they do what they do a lot more profitable and it breeds sympathy it breeds sympathy tolerance and kindness to know all is to forgive all criticize, condemn, or complain. It's a lot.